Okay. Seems like we've put a few people around. So I want to say g'day, everybody. I'm Ben Cullen from Trust for Nature, and thanks so much for joining us for this special event where we're celebrating the permanent protection of Muramura. It's been a long time coming, and we're really excited that you've been able to come and join us today. Um, a lot of uh, today has been a big lead up of hard work, and we're going to hear directly from the people who've been able to do it themselves in person uh, right now. Um, but before we get started, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land of which we're meeting. And because it's a webinar, we're coming in, coming in from many different places. Personally, I'm coming in from the Bunurong land. Um, but I'd like to, on behalf of all of us, acknowledge the elders, both past, present and emerging from wherever we're coming from. I think we've even got some international visitors too. So welcome to them. For, today, for today's session, we're gonna hear about the process, the history and the outcome of years of conservation work. It's gonna be first-hand information right from the very beginning to where we are today. Um, starting off, I wanna remind everyone that there's an option to ask questions through the event through the Q&A uh, box at the bottom of your screen. If you just type in there, we'll get to as many of those questions as we can through the day. And first of all, I'm gonna pass over to Glenn Morris, who's an important member of Muramura and a really lovely person. He's got a great YouTube channel, um, which I'll just plug for you, Glenn. But um, I'll pass over to you and thank you so much for getting us started. <sighs> Thanks. Thanks very much, Ben. Um, yeah, so I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the, um, this land of the Yarra Valley. It's the Wurundjeri people, both past, present and emerging. And uh, I'll um, uh, hand back to you, Ben. Great, great, great. Um, so today we're going to hear uh, a, a lot of different stories and um, be speaking first to Peter, who has had a huge role in protecting Muramura right since the very start. Peter, I can't big you up enough in the lead up to this, but you've got such a great knowledge and have been at the front seat of a lot of the conservation work on the property. Can we pass over to you and hear some of the history? Thanks, Ben. Yes, um, well, we first, I first started, uh, we first started work on trying to get a covenant over Muramura about 10 years ago, a couple of years after you joined Trust for Nature. And we did, uh, uh, communicate about that, but uh, in those days, there was a lot more stronger opposition to it. Uh, the feeling being in a sense that why do we need to have a covenant when we're a conservation cooperative ourselves? Why do we need to be accountable to an outside organisation? That sort of a point of view. And I think um, 10 years later, climate emergency, the ecological catastrophe that's happening, I think the opinions have changed somewhat and uh, our, our battle with Holly uh, has been ongoing and it still continues. And I think um, we we all I think we all need partners in conservation if we're going to be successful. So Mora Mora is uh, as you as you would have seen with Glenn's great aerials. Um, uh, it consists of 245 hectares of land on top of Mount Tulbawong. We have uh, 30 houses in six clusters, so they're fairly tight clusters to reduce minimise their environmental footprint. And basically on the on the cleared land on top of the mountain, and this, um, and we have still have after we've been here nearly fifty years. Started in nineteen seventy four, we still got live birds, we still got wombats, we still got uh, wallabies, but unfortunately uh, we've lost our koala bears, which we used to have. But nevertheless, we have discovered, unbelievably, in the in the process of us creating this covenant, that we've got lead beater possums. Thanks um, to Hardy, one of our members, and also to help from uh, the zoo and uh, Mount Tullawong Land Care. We got that confirmed. And uh, that gave us a real boost, I think, to getting this covenant on the property. So I'll leave it at that, I think, at this point. Can you tell us a little bit about the how you found the property or how you came about it in the first instance? Oh, well, it's just a little bit of an age ad, tiny wee little ad in the age. And we've been looking for land uh, we wanted to start this co-op. We've been looking for land for two years and <clears throat> we drove up this little winding road. There's a dead end road wind up. I'd never heard of Mount Tulbawong. We come out up this road and then we come opens up on this great plateau. Oh my God. And, uh, and, one, and um, anyway, I said, we can't afford this. No, no, no. This is too magnificent. We can't afford this. And I was telling my students, one of my students about it, I was complaining that, um, 
oh, I wish we'd got that property. I was so magnificent. And he said, well, but we didn't have the money. And he said, well, why didn't you ask me? I said, you drive around in a beat up hole. And what, would, where would you, what money would you have? Well, you could have asked. And he hit. So he provided the second mortgage that enabled us to, with $600 deposit, to secure the land until such time as we got it. And we bought it without having a permit to develop it. We, it was, took a big risk because at that point, only six houses were able to be built, one house per 100 acres. And it was quite a battle to get the council to be persuaded that we would have these tight clusters and our environmental rules, no dogs and cats, all this would mean we don't have the equivalent of six houses, which was absolute bullshit, but never mind. We persuaded them. So there you go. That's a bit of the history. Wonderful. And I guess in case it hasn't been mentioned, for those who might be joining us from afar, Murumuru is in Mount Tilbourne, which is probably not too far from Healesville, would be the best way to describe it, I'm guessing, for those who don't know the area too well. And it's basically at the top of a um, small mountain and it's um, the property expands over actually the very tip of it. Um, so I think next I might just give a bit of an introduction to who Trust for Nature is because we're already starting to hear this term covenant and for that reason I might give you a bit of an update on who we are and how it works. Um, so I'll just share my screen. Hopefully you can all see that. If anyone sees the number of slides that I've got, don't be daunted. I'm not doing all of them now. It's going to be okay. Um, uh, so first of all, Trust for Nature is one of many organisations around Australia that focus on permanent protection on private land. And it was started in 1972 under the Victorian Conservation Trust Act. It was set up to empower landholders to be able to protect their own properties, but also to allow people to contribute to the state's ecology by donating land and things like that. Really, um, for a period, it was known as the Hippie Act. <laughs> um, and it was really about helping people to protect the environment around them and giving them the power to do so. We've got a couple of tools for conservation um, and they are our conservation covenants, which I'll explain shortly, our stewardship program, land acquisition and revolving fund. There's a few more, but these are the ones that will be the focus of today and they fit in with today's story. Now, a conservation covenant, for those of you who haven't heard, is a legally binding agreement that sits on the title of your property that outlines why your property should be protected for its conservation values and also what needs to be done to maintain those values. It's a strong document and it needs to be because every time the property changes hands in the future, it's an in perpetuity agreement, it sits on title and protects those values. It's very tailored to every property that we make. So every person has different um, uh, specificity, specific, oh God, I better jump that word. But uh, every title has different values. Uh, property has different values and we have to define and explain how we're going to protect those into the future. And to give an example, covenants aren't always over a whole property, like in the case of Murumura. They can be after over a portion of the property that has conservation values or they can be over the whole of the property and define domestic areas and things like that. So once again, playing on that thing of, being specific to every property and defining where those conservation values sit on the land. Across Victoria, all these little red dots are the conservation covenants and you can see how important they are for genetic flow, for habitat corridors, for linking together with our national parks and state parks to provide protected areas right across our state. And you can see certain areas of the state have more covenants than others. And it really comes from landholder interest and, and willingness for people to get involved in these sorts of programs like we're going to talk about today. If we zoom in a little closer to Greater Melbourne and into the region of where we all find um, the Murumura property, you can see there's quite a few covenants through the Yarra Ranges and heading up into um, Nilambic and those sort of areas. It's an important place for covenants and covenants do help to protect species that aren't otherwise protected in other parts of the reserve system like national parks and state parks. So they have a really important role in complementing the reserves that we have. And they're being um, led by people who are passionate about protecting the environment on their own property. It's still your property, very much so, but you're just part of a movement that wants to protect its conservation values. And we can look at little dots on a map and they mean one thing, but they also mean this, which is a group of people who are committed to protecting the values of their property. Whether they're a first generation covenant and that they put them on themselves, 
or they've bought a property with a conservation covenant, we deal with lots of landholders who are really passionate about the environment. And this is what it sort of looks like. And it doesn't just look like people, of course, for every property, there's a variety of threatened species generally in communities that um, are being protected by that covenant and really important things for the state of Victoria. Uh, it's one thing to have a conservation agreement, which is a covenant, um, which is the paper, the, the, the deed that's on title. We also need a stewardship program and that's what we have where we go and visit these properties to make sure they're being looked after but really to assist the landholders to look after the property. And we do this by doing flora and fauna surveys, noting changes over time, assisting landholders with management issues. You know, you might have an erosion issue or rabbit issue. We have staff there that are designed to help you and assist you in these sorts of things. But really a stewardship uh, visit is about ensuring the property is being protected and helping to make sure that we can protect all the conservation values that are there. Uh, we do find things too and having data that goes back you know 20 30 years we can watch species come and go we can watch changes in the landscapes and all that can inform past and future management um, i'll just touch on this briefly but we have a revolving fund where we can purchase um, properties that come up for sale and then we on sell them with a conservation covenant so we protect the values and all the money goes back into that revolving fund so if you know an important property that's for sale um, we can use this tool to protect an area and then recuperate the funds to buy more land. And historically, Trust for Nature has helped to purchase a lot of properties uh, around the state, as well as owning some currently. And some of the popular ones that you might have come across include um, big areas of Greens Bush, um, uh, Arthur Seat State Park, parts of Craigieburn Grassland, Edith Bower Wetlands. All these properties came through uh, Trust for Nature, which was then Victorian Conservation Trust, um, and have led to some of the most important places that we have around Victoria for their conservation um, values. Um, we have a, a lot of reserves still to this day, um, and there's some metrics there that you can apply if, if, uh, if they're of interest. And when you have this many reserves, um, we have about nine in the Greater Melbourne area, um, we, we rely on people like committees of management and friends groups to assist us in managing these properties. And we've got some wonderful people, just like the wonderful people there are at Murramura, who've come together and done great work on, on these properties um, to ensure that they're going to hold this legacy and be of value for a long time. And another part of Trust for Nature's work is also that we work closely with traditional owners. Um, it's a big part of our work to learn from traditional owners and assist where we can in helping to achieve their objectives. And there's just a couple of things that we've been doing, like running a conservation and man land management course um, and knowledge sharing sessions. Where we're able to teach each other about um, looking at the land from different perspectives and protecting it for different values. And I'll just flick through some photos just quickly. Um, before we get more into the specifics of Murumura, but just to give you a vibe of some of the things that Trust for Nature does. And we have landed at this property. And before I get into the detail about the conservation values and um, the project that we've been working with with faunal emblems, um, I think we could pa pass back to Glenn and Peter to hear a little bit more about their process of going through the government. Okay. Um, so um, we, well, just to, Basically, um, I felt the time was right to try again. And I got together a group of people who have worked for the last three years with uh, Andrew from the Trust and to some extent with Ben at certain strategic moments when he came in and helped to save the day. Um, so we worked through, for the aim, aim was the big aim. We had the big picture with the Hulk. We wanted the whole property to be covenanted. And that of course is a big was a big challenge. And it's one thing for a, a couple of a couple to agree to covenant their land. It's a quite another for a whole community to agree to covenant their land and to cover covenant the whole land, which encompasses our li their lifestyles and how they live. And I mean, I'll ask Glenn to make some comments about some of the concerns he had to illustrate the, the sorts of um, uh, concerns that were expressed with the idea of a total covenant. So we worked. You know, the, and some of those things were, for example, um, concern about constraining our future choices, about 
whether or not I could have my have a, a, a bike trail and uh, through the forest, whether I would have access to uh, forest at the back of a, my house to cut down trees to for my wood wood, um, and just the general feeling of uh, which was reflected in the first time about um, do we need another organisation to be accountable to? We've got local council, we're an environmental organisation. What the hell do we need to be accountable to another bureaucracy? Um, but I mean, anyway, Glenn, do you want to add something here? Yeah, sure. So I'd probably put myself in the category of I was a little hesitant about the concept of a covenant to start with. I thought oh, I was just, you know, something Peter dreamt up. Um, <laughs> I must admit being somewhat ignorant of the history of trust for nature. And so, uh, you know, it took a while to build, excuse the pun, trust in the organisation. Um, so, you know, as a community, there's like 40 plus members here that all collectively make decisions about the use of this land. And so they've all got very different opinions about how it should be managed. And we have lots of committees and meetings and, um, you know, decision making processes. So um, Peter um, spearheaded the process and, um, you know, there was a kind of a bit uh, of sense of it's going too fast. We, we're not ready. So it got pushed back um, by a couple of years or more um, as the we brought more people on board. And as Peter already highlighted, there were concerns about the use of what would be under the covenant. So things like, um, you know, there's teenagers here have built mountain bike tracks, low impact, just dirt, you know, no permanent structures, but they ride through the forest um, as part of, you know, their entertainment. It's been great during COVID, I can tell you. Um, also, there's a bit of wood harvesting that goes on, but we've actually planted a lot of our own woodlots outside of the um, Covenant area anyway, so it's probably, you know, redundant. But there's some historical woodlots from the early days of Murumura that we kind of were basically saying, no more, we'll leave those to nature. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the opposition was, you know, varied. Um, why do we need to do it was one of the questions. Well, we, aren't we just managing the land ourselves? You know, why do we need another organisation to tell us how to manage it? Um, but as you know, as Peter and Ben have pointed out, um, these are in perpetuity. It's not just, you know, the lifespan of a few members here. It's uh, going forward into, um, you know, any possible use of this property. And as Peter highlighted, you know, there was a strong sense of ecology and about forming the co-op in the early days, and that's really sus been sustained throughout. So, you know, people are um, very concerned about uh, the ecology of the site and, you know, learning more about it as you live here, discovering what we thought were endangered species that weren't here, like lead as possum, that was pretty amazing. Um, yeah, all of those things kind of add up to why it's important for uh, this covenant to go ahead. That's great. That's yeah, great. I think, um, look, some of that leads and I'm excited to actually get into the, <laughs> the reason about how important it is to have protected this property. And but I think you can start to get a feel for those who are watching that there's a lot of people involved in this decision. And so it was a big thing for this many people to come together with the one agreement in mind and work towards the common goal of protecting the property. And it's been a huge achievement to protect this. But I've got to hold off on that. I'll get to that in a second. I think um, we wanted to make this a bit of a dialogue and discussion about how a covenant goes on and how you work through people's interests. And we've, we've heard some of the uh, concerns. We've got our legal counsel, Sarah Brugler, on um, as well. I was just going to pass over to Sarah to explain about how we work through some of those concerns and how we fit it together with the um, uh, covenant. Um, so, Sarah, are you there? Hello, Ben. Hello, Peter, Glenn. Yes, I am. Good day, Sarah. <laughs> Hi. All right, so Sarah, you um, are often at the sort of coal face of, of dealing with when we've got a covenant that we want to set up to protect and we've got landholders who are interested in protecting certain values. What are the mechanisms that we use and how do we allow for things um, within the covenant without compromising the conservation values? Yeah, that's right. And it's, it's a really interesting process and it's an absolute privilege for me sitting as legal counsel of Trust for Nature that I get to um, see these properties that are being protected and manage the, the legal work that, that puts in paper and that then goes to the registration on the title of a property. So that's sort of my level of involvement and, and really the, the property, um, you know, the, the terms of, of the covenant design and, and and what areas are and aren't to be protected really um that starts at a that that sort of andrew and ben were discussing that 
as, as you've already mentioned, for some time with Peter and Muramura. And so that was really a quite a developed stage when then it came over to the Trust for Nature legal team and we started to draft up the documents. And, and what gets registered on the title is the deed of covenant and that's um, entered into between the landowner and Trust for Nature and that eventually goes to the Minister for the Environment for her approval before it then goes to registration on title. And that's what gives these agreements such strength and rigour because of that process that it goes through that means that it's very, very difficult for them to ever be removed. Um, and so, and, and so we, we have quite a standard template for a deed that goes on title that really has a standard level of protection. As I said, what is negotiated is the covenant design. So where you've got a conservation tier and a modified use tier, like we have at Muramura property, where you've got a higher level of protection for the, the forested areas and, and a um, slightly different level of protection that's appropriate for a more modified area. And then what we did with more and more, as we do with all of our covenants, is we really, we then look at well, what's the existing use. And we've already talked about some of the, um, you know, collection of um, firewood and collection of wood at certain areas of the property. And so what, what are the existing uses that happen? What are the planned uses in the future? And how can we accommodate that within um, the covenant design and also the discretionary allowances that Trust for Nature can allow that is specific to that particular owner. So that was um, part of the negotiation that, um, that Trust for Nature was having at that, those final stages with, with more and more and that negotiation was really led by Peter on behalf of more and more who was you know this fantastic he would sort of collate the questions from the community they would come to us, we work together the answers to provide the clarity on what um, different clauses of the covenant means, what we can allow discretionary approval for. And so it was really, that was a real um, team effort because, and it was it was more complicated because Peter was having to, to go back and, and talk to his committees and his community and, and have all the answers ready. So we were sort of trying to provide as much information as possible um, so that we could sort of navigate those, those processes of what are, you know, they end up being, they are quite legalistic documents. And so it really is important for landowners to understand them when they're entering into them. I think one of the sticking points was the um, chooks, wasn't it? At one point. <laughs> we, um, you know, we're, Trust for Nature generally, we, we often have domestic areas within a covenant, but but our, our standard allowances is, uh, are for a couple or for a family on a property, but where you've got a community that's living there, you know, their, their needs and requirements and particularly where there's a lot of sustainable sort of living that's happening, um, that that's, was a big discussion about whether we include the domestic area under covenant or not. And in the end, um, the community decided, you know what, it's not quite right for us to have that community living space under covenant and, and we focused on the, on the vegetation spaces. Yeah, so it was, if I could say, it was, I mean, the, 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 the proposal about over the whole co-op was put to the community and uh, although there was a majority support, there wasn't an overwhelming support and we didn't feel that we should push it through in, in the face of opposition. We wanted to have a, a really strong consensual support for it and that's why we, we withdrew and came up with the compromise, which was to put a covenant over the forest which under our procedure required two thirds majority for at a special general meeting, which was the first one in 48 years we've ever called. But it was, we felt it was important not just to put it through a normal director's meeting that they have the, a, an overall community meeting where we're all embracing it. And there was still some opposition, but 78% uh, supported it, which was um, a very pleasing result in terms of, given that we are committing to sacrifice our ability to make choices in the future for the sake of, of the ecology. So we are putting aside our power for the sake of in, empowering the, the ecology of other species, which is you know fantastic. Anyway, enough yes. for me for the moment. No, that's a, that's a huge achievement. And thank you. Thanks for running through that too, Sarah. I think Glenn's about to take us through some Q&A, but just before we do that, I thought um, now we've got the sort of narrative going of We've got this tool which provides conservation covenants, a mechanism for landholders to protect their own properties. And we've got a community of landholders who are keen to protect their own property. The next step came with what I'm about to share. If I 
if I'd linked that up quickly, I would have gone seamlessly, but unfortunately it didn't happen. Sorry, guys. But um, close enough, we head over to where I'm going to talk a little bit about the significance of the property itself. So let's look at Muramura here. Here's a map of the covenant that we've been able to place on. The covenant is a huge achievement in terms of um, ecological values because it's protecting so much area. That's 180 hectares of the property has been protected. It's the area defined in red and it covers across two parcels as you'll see there. So it's a really large area um, and it's part of a project um, that we have called the Faunal Emblems Project. It's a state government project um, run through Delport Phillip and it involves um, a couple of key partners and then a whole group of other partners as well. And I've got to sort of tip the hat um, quite literally to all these groups have been involved because this has very much been a partnership approach to doing this. Um, uh, uh, just to, to mention a few things just off the bat is, you know, Port Phillip and Western Port CMA um, gave a grant and gave um, some assistance to the property that made it more suitable to Covenant, which was a really great outcome. They also worked with, um, I believe, the Mount Tullibawong and District's Land Care, Karen Garth. They've done great work in working with zoos to find that lead beaters possum that we'll talk about shortly. But there's been a whole range of partners who've come together to make this happen. And um, I'll just go through. Another partner too has been in, in part of putting this covenant on, we've been working closely with the Wurundjeri Wurrung Narrap Ranges, which is a Wurundjeri led business that does land management and conservation works. Um, we, we're lucky to have Dana come and work alongside us and help us with some of our camera monitoring and a few other things that we're doing around the area. So I just thought I'd give her and the Wurundjeri Narrap a shout out at this point. Um, the Faunal Emblems Project focuses on two endemic species to Victoria. I won't go into too much detail because that's probably for another day, but I do want to mention that um, these species are really, uh, both our faunal emblems, our avian emblem and our faunal emblem, um, are, are really in, have been in dire straits, so to speak, and we've been working with many agencies together, coming with a united front to do the best activities we can to protect them. Um, species like the helmeted honey eater, honey eater, which is um, wild population around Yellingbow, captive population working with um, Zoos Victoria. Um, and it's been a, a big process of trying to identify land that we can protect, as well as help this species breed up to a number where it's going to be um, self-sustainable in the wild. It's critically endangered. And it largely, as I said before, occurs in the Yellingbow area. At one stage, there were less than 50 of them around. And now we're getting the numbers up and there's a bit of a good news story there. Um, more pertaining to this particular site is the lead beaters possum. Um, there's two distinct populations of this species. Um, it's critically endangered. And just to remind everyone what that means, critically endangered means of all the threatened species we have in Australia, right around the country, this comes to the top of the pops. It's in the top of the list with a few other species that are considered most endangered and most likely to become extinct soon without critical intervention. And so we're all working really hard to protect these species. And part of that is finding out where these species occur. They're really dependent on habitat types. They're dependent on food sources and um, they're hugely restricted to their previous um, uh, range of where they used to occur. So we're doing everything we can to protect it in the wild. And the fact that this has been found on this property is very exciting. And I'll explain why in a few seconds. Um, Murumur is, as I mentioned before, 180 hectares of covenanted property that we have, have now been able to add into this reserve system. It contains wet and damp forests and even patches of mountain ash. And those of you who know mountain ash, it's a large eucalypt and the forests um, are known for storing the most carbon out of any forest in the world. They grow to the tallest flowering trees in the world. I think um, we know there's ones that get up to 100 metres tall. And they also provide habitat to the critically endangered Lebedus possum that we were talking about before. Um, and it's all very interdependent on these um, sort of uh, habitat values and the species being present. And so we have to do everything we can, especially when these things are on private land, to find ways that we can protect it. On top of the Leadbeaters, we've got powerful owl lace monitors, and I'm pretty sure someone's going to find a greater glider up there. If, if not in the next few years, because they've certainly been seen around the area. 
One of the great values of this property too is it's got these large hollow bearing trees, which is suitable for some of these arboreal mammals, some of these possums and things like that that are moving through. Um, having these large trees with hollows um, are often removed from properties or fall over over time or, or cleared for various reasons. Um, having these on site is a really important um, value for, for this property. It's been well managed too. I've got to give a hat off to the Murumura people who have done an amazing job of maintaining the site, um, protecting what's there on the ground. You know, they've got, uh, they've done a lot of weed control and they're very passionate about the property. That's really clear. When I've spoken to any of the people who are associated, they really, really care about this place and want to see the best for it. And that's why we've been so excited that that next stage of being able to put something on that's going to retain those values forever and ever has been achieved. And, and that's why we're here today. Um, another great thing is it's got eight springs that emanate off the property and they flow into the Don River and then they flow into the Yarra River. So if you're walking through South Bank or something, there's a chance you might be walking past <laughs> the river that has flown right out of this property. Like this is an important part of the catchment. And it's something that we're all connected to that we might not realise as much that these things are out there. And, they, you know, it's the flowing veins through our cities and everything that come from properties like this that help filtrate the water with natural plants. And it's also the heart, uh, we're getting into veins and hearts and all sorts of things here, but it's also the heart of a newly forming cluster of covenants. As this covenant has gone on, it's been, um, there's been four or five other properties that have followed suit. Um, some parallel, some because of this property. It means that a large area of Tullabong moving down to Hillsville, um, private landholders have been able to place these covenants on through the um, Faunal Emblems program. And that's meant that we've got more protection for these leadbeater's possums and other really endangered species that occur in the area that are of national significance because they can move around and not only be protected here, but they can expand their habitats, knowing that these sites are going to be protected into the future. Um, so as we look a bit closer, um, I'll just jump and you can see at some of those purple ones are some of the adjoining covenants that we have now that are either new or, or come on fairly recently. So it expands the habitat that's protected. Um, so it's quite a connected area, all privately owned, but protected for its conservation values. And as we zoom out, this doesn't show those new covenants. We haven't got them ready to show yet. But what it does show is that the linkages that occur sort of stretch out from those red areas and um, expand. And like I said before, habitat corridors, genetic flow, all these things can occur because we're protecting more land. And with our partners like Parks Victoria, zoos, the CMA and others, and land care, of course, we can work to work with more landholders do complementary works across the parks onto private land, those sorts of things. And that's why we're so excited about what's happening today. I've got a few photos to quickly show before we get to q and I'm sorry if I'm going too long. Um, uh, with uh, the Murumura people, as well as um, Mount Tullabong District uh, Land Care, as well as support from the CMA and state government, and as well as Zoos God, it's a big list, but they're all integral in making this happen. They've been able to do some camera monitoring and they've seen some things here like a feather tail glider, um, which are really small and really difficult to detect. I've spotlighted for many years and never seen one, but apparently they're, they're more common. Um, you can see here uh, a sugar glider and a ringtail possum meeting together. You can get a bit of an idea. A lead bed is probably closer to the sugar glider size than the ringtail size if you haven't seen one before. Um, so there's two possums meeting for a, um, a bit of a sticky beak. Um, here's a sugar glider here that was seen and um, giving an, an, an interesting look, but we're moving all towards our peace, de resistance, or whatever that phrase is. Um, this is a lead beaters possum here that's been found on the property. This is on Muramura, a lead beaters critically endangered possum on private land being protected pretty much from today onwards, thanks to the work of the Muramura people, which is a great, great outcome. I know it looks upside down. So I put it like that as well. I think that's the way it's supposed to go, but we'll look at it from this angle. You can get a bit of a feel for this faunal emblem that's been protected by Trust for Nature covenants, but thanks to hugely the will of the people of the Murumura Cooperative and all the work they've done to work through this covenant, make it happen. And uh, I really think they've done something um, not just for the community, but for all of us, but by, by taking the steps to protect these species. Um, 
yeah, and so I think I'll pass it back to Glenn, who might have some Q and A's to go through. Yes, thanks, Ben. They're, they're great looking at those photos. Um, so I'd just like to reach out to all the attendees. It's, it's a great opportunity to ask questions of our panellists using the Q&A format. So just down the bottom of your screen, you'll see Q&A, little bubbles. Just uh, type them in there and I'll, I'll point the questions to relevant people. So first up, we've got a question for Sarah. Uh, this one's from Tony. So are conservation covenants all on private land? Simple answer, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that was an easy one. And uh, for Ben, it's another one from Tony. Is there a minimum size for a property to be considered for a conservation covenant? Yeah, look, we take into a few things when we're looking at conservation covenants. We take into a size, size uh, if it connects to other areas um, and if it has threatened species. And depending on, you know, it might not have size, but it might be directly connected to something or have threatened species. There's a couple of variables that we throw up to see if we can fit a smaller covenant in. Generally, we're looking for larger habitats, but if you've got something small and important, um, please give us a call, we'd be really interested. Oh, um, what's a good question? I could probably can answer this one or Peter. So it's question is uh, for Murumura, what wildlife do we see on the property? What have you seen later, lately, Peter? Yeah, well, the live birds love, love this sort of uh, snowy, uh, snow. we had snow yesterday, amazingly love this cloudy wet weather they start dancing around and in fact i had one nest in the in the head of a tree fern which was up against my house and i heard that somebody else up at another cluster john's place the one's nested in a sort of roof cave or something i haven't seen exactly but we've got plenty of live birds which i think is very special wombats uh uh wallabies uh the uh, and um of course Newman's birds birds gone berserk up here uh so yeah that's that's the sort of core cool ones that i think of it's also the less popular ones so uh, so snakes <laughs> we we have a good collection of snakes here um uh, no, don't go there don't go there it's just fine <laughs> and also frogs so um they're they're a regular little visitor here a lot of the the, the fauna and flora that we find or fauna here, here is result of no cats and dogs policy so you know wombats here rule the land they just walk around like they own the place and the same with live birds they're virtually you know um tame but that because there's no threats to them on a daily basis they just get used to people being around so yeah that's that's a nice thing and people really appreciate that so thanks peter um i have a pet one actually up here which used to follow me around like a dog so in fact i think we should change the law so people could have native pets rather than this uh cats and dogs everywhere let's not go down that rabbit hole <laughs> peter um <laughs> okay so uh question for trust for nature so maybe this is ben or sarah um what does a property need to have to be covenanted and does it cost anything um that's a great question um so as far as what it needs to have is some conservation values of interest. So if you've got a forest, um, we'd be really keen to come have a look at it. We find the most amazing things when we go out to people's houses and sometimes people not, might not even realise that they have something of national significance in their backyard. And so just um, giving us a brief description of what you've got and hopefully we can come out there. Does it cost money? Um, look, when we're supported by programs like Faunal Emblems, it gives us funding to be able to go out and put covenants on people's properties and um, even provide, um, in this instance, we're able to assist um, with some weed control as well. Um, but I think, um, yeah, look, as long as these programs keep running and we get support from that, we're able to come out and provide covenants in the area. Cool, thanks, Ben. Um, question from Marion, this is for Peter. Are deer present? Have you seen a deer, Peter? Yes, I, we have plenty of deer up here. We have, luckily, one of our neighbors is a deer hunter. So it's a constant um, yeah, issue, deer. And originally, when they, we first found them, the government, the department wasn't interested and said there wasn't a problem. So the government's now, the department's now woken up that there is a problem, and they're right through the whole of Victoria. And uh, and so they're a significant big animal. But if we climb an emergency and food security, it might be a bit of a backup for food supply if we can't get rid of them. Okay, well, well, we'll dodge that one for the vegans <laughs> present. Um, so this one's uh, also for you, Peter. So Prue asks, why did the koalas disappear? I don't know. When I when we first came here, that we used to have I used to have koalas outside my 
window here and uh, I haven't seen them for uh, it's like about eight or ten years so I don't know why they've disappeared it'd be great if we could reintroduce them uh, obviously they were able to survive up here I don't know it's something for trust for nature to have a look at actually and another one for you Peter um, this is uh, did the covenant prevent you from doing things you were doing previously the covenant we've actually finally got no I think the original one we put up would have had some restrictions but uh, I think trust worked very hard to try and accommodate uh, us so that we, there wouldn't be much impact. But um, yes, to have conservation, living with people who live here, living with conservation, living in, in a forest environment and so forth, does involve some sort of at least duty of care, uh, some constraint, some uh, consciousness that the rest of nature matters too. Cool. Well, that brings us to the end of the Q&A at the moment, but uh, we might come back if there's more questions later on. So I'll hand back to you, Ben. Hey, um, yeah, I wonder, I, I might just throw one into the mix for you guys. Um, I think for, for some of us, uh, certainly for me in this experience, we're not used to working with um, co-ops and, and groups of people to, who've come together. Can you explain what it's like living on a co-op and, and, and working with um, different people and having similar objectives and so forth? Okay, I'll start with that one, but Peter's got, going to finish it. Um, look, I, I call um, living on a co-op like being in a lifeboat. Uh, you know, you might not get on with everyone in the lifeboat, but you've got to work things out because it's in your mutual best interest. So, yeah, people sometimes have this thought that we're all like-minded people. We just, you know, love being in everyone's presence. But there's conflict, there's resolution of conflict, there's decisions to be made that are hard, like the Covenant. Um, but we're sort of committed to working through those things. How about you, Peter? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, we wouldn't. This would not have happened if it wasn't for the team effort of um, Mark, Sean, Luke, uh, Holger. A small group of us worked diligently for three years on this project. So we have to cooperate. And uh, as I say to people who want to come and join Mora Mora, you can by all means come and join. But if you haven't not prepared to work on your side of the problem, then it better st best if you don't. So there's obviously everybody's got issues. And that's part of the beauty of the community. Community gives you feedback about who you are, how you're going, as well as being a supportive structure. So yeah, we've developed over 50 years a, a ways of making decisions, ways of working with um, conflict in a way that we aim for consensus. We don't always get it, and we don't and don't insist on it either. We don't want to allow one individual like me stopping the whole group make a decision. So. Um, I think going forward, we're going to need to live a lot more in cooperatives, a lot more back into community, a lot more back into village in the local street in order to give us localization is going to be critical to our future. So, yeah, we're a bit of a, a pilot scheme on that. Uh, we're not the only one. There are a lot of them around Victoria and around the world. Uh, but um, it's not an easy road. It's challenging. It's exciting. It ain't boring. It's so great. And the fact that you've all been able to come together to do something um, so selfless is amazing. It's so we, we really appreciate it. While we're doing acknowledgements, I should mention Andrew Coolman from Cross Nature Side, Rachel Douglas and Jade all really worked tirelessly with you guys to do this. And I think um, I want to say a big thank you to the Murumura community and those guys for, for really pushing this through. There's so many people involved in getting a big outcome like this. And um, yeah, it's almost sure that we're going to forget to mention someone, but um, Arabella for sending those pictures too that the zoos did. There's, there's just so much going on that's been such a big part of achieving this, but today we can really celebrate. And now I think for many of us, when we were in the Toolbrong area, even in Hillsville, and you can look up and think that um, that site's been protected by the good work of, of your community is, is truly amazing. Yeah, and I, I want to get second the thing about Andrew. Andrew working, I work very closely with Andrew, and he's terrific, uh, and a great team team player. As um, yeah, and so it was wonderful. And he he'd been up here as a woofer beforehand, so he had a bit of an attachment to the place, which I think helped him cope with the ups and downs of the of the whole process when we got a bit tired and wondering whether it would ever happen, and uh, and even the trust was getting a little bit jittery around the edges when it came to the. Uh, at the end there. So understandably. Anyway, wonderful journey. Um, was there any extra questions you saw come through, Glenn, that was Yes, there was a little flood of them, actually. It's nothing like saying that's the end of Q&A to kick people along. <laughs> um, so um, 
First up, there was a question, can, how do we visit Murumura? So I actually put a link to the website, murumura.org.au, uh, information about open days, etc. Because of COVID, we have really had a stop on open days, but it's been a tradition the first Sunday of every month from one till four, you turn up at, you know, just before one, you get a tour, basically uh, each of the six clusters take turns at showing people around, um, parts of the co-op, um, we, you know, normally get numbers of, you know, 10 to 20 or so people or more. Um, there's a follow-up question to that too, is um, how does someone join Murumura? Peter? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's um, joining more and more takes time. So you're joining a community. It's not like you're just buying the house next door. It's about um, whether what, who you, what you're interested in, what you're keen about matches with what we are on about. And it's a two year process of getting to know each other and finding out and getting past the honeymoon. The, the, don't get married in the honeymoon. Get past the honeymoon before you get married. And that's the, that's the principle we've adopted because um, when people come up here, they go, wow, yeah, isn't it wonderful? Oh, yeah, wonderful. Yeah, everybody's terrific, blah, blah. Yeah, that's great. Uh, we all need a honeymoon, but uh, it's, it's past it. That's the time to make the decision and we really begin to see each other more clearly. Thanks, Peter. There's a question from Gail. How many households are involved? Uh, so there is uh, about 30 homes here. There's uh, about 40 something members and about 70 people, including children. So uh, in terms of changeover, that's a follow up for Gail. Um, Peter, what do you reckon the average stay here is? Well, we've had about 110 members over the 48 years and of which 40 are still here. So that gives you an idea. A suburb normally changes every three years the turnover we so we have a very slow turnover and that helps to build the solidity of the community and and the continuity of it but at the same time people do do leave they do move on but i think life how long are members along you know at least 10 years or so before people would so often people move on partly because they might split up as a couple uh career opportunities on multiplicity of reasons why people leave um as well as why they join really yeah, I mean, from my perspective, I think another strong motivation for joining is a great place to raise a family, but then that sort of comes to an end, kids leave home and you're empty nesters, and it's sometimes a point where people change their direction in their life. So that's often another point where they might exit. Um, what else have we got here? Um, we've got the how to join and a question, any advice to other co-ops wanting to protect land? Who wants this one? Well, I'll pass over to you, Sarah. Oh. Who's two? Ben, you go. All right. Yeah, yeah look, I, I think we get some interest. We actually have some other co-ops who have gone down this path. What would you say from your perspective, Sarah, what's the best way for a multiple landholder agreement to come through? Look, I think um, having consensus amongst a group of people, particularly where you really are, this type of consensus where it is um, complex, a complex legal negotiation as well as just the the direction that you might be taking your property in is is challenging in itself let alone where you've got a number of members and I think probably from my perspective why Mora Mora was successful was to have that Peter as the contact point for Trust for Nature who could navigate and and really got to grips with what the Trust for Nature processes were and were was very willing to work with them and then also could navigate his way through the more and more community as well. So I think having that one point of contact made it, um, it made things much simpler and straightforward for what is essentially a complex negotiation. So I think, um, you know, I would recommend if, if there was a, a co-op in a similar circumstances that that was a really great model to, to take that negotiation forward. And Peter, you might have some thoughts on that. Yeah, well, I think I think I, I would, it wouldn't have happened unless there was a team. If I didn't have a team behind this part of it, I don't think we would have got it through. So it, I wouldn't have been six. I couldn't have done this by myself. So I think that's important. While it'd be good to have a person come and deal with the trust, I think they need to be coming out of being part of a group who are committed to the, the, the long term of making it happen. And I also think just to remind people, 
it's something helps the community to be cohesive or the co-op to be cohesive, the fact that it's making a commitment to something bigger than itself. And in this case, we're making a commitment to the larger ecology. And I think that helps to locate the community in a larger um, field. And I think that's important to its own viability to, to keep the community cohesive. Ben, I might just squeeze in one more question and a, and a comment too. So from Aline, she's uh, saying it's uh, great to, she's very excited about um, the growing cluster of covenants on the mountain and excited about that. So I think there uh, must be another, another covenant. That's great to hear. And a question from Keith, which is a really interesting one about conservation. Um, he says, I wonder how much the notion of conservation in, in inverted commas has changed with the trust for nature in recent times from isolated wilderness to humans as part of nature? Ben? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, look, I think Trust for Nature is in, uh, in the business of dealing with landholders who live on a property, uh, generally live on the property, wanting to protect their own property. So we're working with people who are on the land, sometimes working the land productively, sometimes doing a whole range of things that's part of them being on the property uh, and working out how protection fits into that picture. So very much it's about working with people and conservation. As we move more into times where urban conservation becomes more important, things like that, it's clear that we need to consider how people interact with nature, how we can protect the conservation values, but also find out ways that people can connect, find their ways to be part of nature and assist in protecting things that um, aren't just for us, but are for so many people around the state. If I could add something, I think it's important. I think the private conservation efforts that you're involved in helps to break down this apartheid between nature's over there in the national park and we're over here in the cities. The, the, the more and more is an example where we're trying to break down that divide uh, and, not, and not just leave nature in some isolated pocket waiting to be destroyed at some future date. So I think uh, private conservation is vitally important as part of the big picture here. And I'd just like to add that the um, part of the, this conservation trust we did get through is that two hectares has been set aside and has a covenant on it for not the protection of wildlife, but of human remains. So in, in memorial of our sanctuary site for people to remember the members who have been here before and so forth. So it is interesting, we're using a conservation framework to protect and honour members who have lived here and died here. And I might just add there that the, it, it's an interesting because Trust for Nature came at that um, aspect from a conservation perspective. And so we applied our conservation framework, but obviously more and more I had a, you know, a, 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 a corresponding goal to having that area protected under that um, modified use area. So it was an interesting sort of alignment of, of, of goals there between the two. And we hope in the future that we'll be able to get permission as a consequence to bury some of our bodies there rather than to burn them and pollute the environment and just have ashes. I think definitely Murumur is going to be a place to watch. Um, and many people, uh, including myself, are going to be following um, what's happening there closely because I think it's such a unique concept, the way it's being delivered, the things that you're achieving out there are going to be fascinating to watch. So I'm, I'm going to enjoy the ride for sure. Um, I don't know if we've got any more questions. We're probably wrapping up. Is there a final question or anything like that? Uh, I think we've answered them. Um, there's just some appreciations from, from Michael. Maxine's just asking about um, open uh, opening up when Melbourne's out of lockdown. We haven't got a date yet for that, but we, we'll follow the the, uh, the directions of the Victorian government to when we can do that. So maybe just watch the website, muramura.org.au, uh, and you'll see when the open days are available again. Back to you, Ben. Yeah, well, and just wrapping up, I just want to thank everyone who's come to attend this webinar and coming to listen and providing your thoughts and questions. It's been absolutely awesome to run through it. I want to thank all the Murumura people for committing to this conservation covenant and working through any um, concerns they had and coming up with something that we're keen to work with so closely um, into the future and also to really... It, 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 um, experience what we're having today of celebrating that this long road has come to an end and um, now the journey of um, working with you to manage the site will, will begin but just acknowledging what a great achievement you've made by protecting this site is, is a huge deal so I just want to say thank you to you guys 
for, for, for doing this and everyone at the community. Can I add that um, we're going to, we still, we, we, we plan to have last weekend an open, open day face to face celebration. And this has been put on as an interim, but we're going to have a, a still have one early in the new year. So you will get all invited to come along face to face, actually hug each other. No kisses allowed, but hugs that will be allowed. And we will celebrate um, face to face in real life this covenant. And thank you all. Thanks. Um, and did you have some photos, Glenn, you might be able to take us out with a few um, shots just for anyone who's interested? If you... Indeed. So as we look through these, I'll just say thanks to everyone for joining us. Please watch these couple of photos as we go through. They're really stunning things they're seeing out there at Murmura. And um, it's a really special place. And I hope we can all get out there one day to enjoy the site. If you want more information about Trust for Nature, please go to trustfornature.org.au. Um, we survive off grants and donations too. If you've got any ability to support us, please have a look on the website. Um, and please check out the Murmura page. It just even just Google Murmura and read about the history. It's, a, it's an amazing place with amazing people and um, it's a big day today. So thank you for joining us. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Glenn. No worries. Thanks, everyone. Bye. See ya.